What's going on, everybody? Drew Sanford here with the Bass Fishing Underground Podcast. Today, we have got local, can I say legend? With legend, yeah. <laughs> As Lo- long as it doesn't have a senior connotation to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> local young gun, Marcus Sakura. <laughs> From Lake of the Ozarks. And if anybody, you know, everybody from Missouri knows who he is, and a lot of guys from around the Midwest know who he is. He's taking people's money from, you name it, on lakes. You've won. What's your favorite win? You've won one or two events. What's your favorite? Yeah, I, you know, whew, boy, that's tough. Obviously, I was just telling somebody earlier today, I mean, that All-American win in 2014 on Wheeler, didn't really was, realize what I had done until literally like last week you know and yeah. i mean and i yeah. mean that was six we all wake ago. up and realize we won the whole american six years later yeah it has been <laughs> <laughs> young gun marcus sakura legend legend, legend. <laughs> no I, I you know if you everybody in the midwest knows him and he takes people's money on ozarks table rock you name it and around here you've cut your teeth in this area trout fishing right Trout fishing, I love to catch me With some Tommy, trout. can we give Tommy a shout out? Yeah, what up, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> Tommy cuts our hair. Yeah. So, uh, Here's my boy. Yep. So, coming up, we're right around the corner from the Big Bass Bash, and I'm sure there's going to be a bajillion, you know, follows and views on this video, uh, guys wanting to fish and, and know what to do. And um, you're not eligible for that one, are you? No, I'm not. I, you know, one thing they do allow me to do though, which is I find a lot of a uh, lot of a lot of joy and pleasure is I, I can take Mason and he can do the youth contest. But then I usually steer him away from the bass because then if he wins the bass, and, oh, that's Marcus's kid. But you know, I don't know. I don't understand. I, I I can't remember the last time I caught a seven. Mason's gonna be a hammer, and we didn't even talk about this. But I was around Mason at what was it? I don't even remember the term a couple weeks ago. Yeah, but uh, he is fired up. He's athletic. He's gonna be hell on wheels. I, you know, I'm not trying to brag on my own bird dog, per se, but I, I took him dock skipping the other day, and I don't know how many co-anglers I've had in the dock, and this is not a knock against them. This is an absolute proud parent moment. He can skip docks better than the last 10 adults I've had in the boat with me. It's, it's unbelievable. He's left-handed. He keeps it in his left hand, and he skips it in there, and he can feel it, and he can crack them. Uh, it, it was an aha moment. I told him when it gets – when it peaks out – I'm taking him out of school, and we are going to go skip docks. That's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. When it's is cool. that? Um, probably here in about another week and a half, two weeks. Ooh. Yeah, yep. I think it's probably going to get going. Like a big bass time frame. Are we just are we just doing teasers for the big bass? <laughs> it all, it all kind of leads us back that way, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It does. They 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 know right when to put them on the sleg. That's a fact. Yeah, it, you know it's fantastic weather. It's fantastic. Um, you know, perfect time for fishing and the seasonality. And then like the resort owners, now all of a sudden they've kind of you know kind of cleared their mind from mm-hmm. the summertime push. So now they're happy to see a big crowd of people. And the restaurants yeah. are happy to. They've kind of got their staffing fixed. I mean, it's just. They the normally have that, the things. Big Bass Bash. They bring, what, four or 5,000 people in, just yeah, stupid amounts. Absolutely. And then they roll right into the Toyota series is normally how it goes. Yeah, yeah. They switched Toyota to the spring this year yep. instead of the fall event. But I'm sure they'll be back in the fall. But, yeah, but that's made it tough because you got three or 4,000 fishing rods out there. And some of these guys, you may never know who they are, and they're not household names, but they know how to flat catch. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And, and they know they're master of this technique, and this is what they want to do, and this is how they want to go catch them. And they absolutely just wear the guts out of them. And then here we go, you know, trying to figure out what crumbs are left on <laughs> Could you imagine if the Toyotas didn't have the Big Bass Bash a week? At, like, even if it was just two weeks spread out, the difference in weight. It'd be a total slugfest. Oh. It'd be a total slugfest. Yep. yep. Cool. Okay. Lake of the Ozarks, October. Yeah. Big fish. Yeah. Yeah. I, Top I, five baits. Yeah, so I think, um, I guess basically, number one, because of undisputedness, I think you have to go with the swim bait side of things, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so, like, this is the part where I have some sort of selfish angst over the situation because I love to throw swim baits, and I don't ever, in a tournament fishing scenario, you know, you're trying to catch as many four-pound-plus fish as you can, mm-hmm. right? Swim bait, you know, it's kind of cool to go out there and fish that bluff that you've never fished and do it at a leisurely pace with the radio and maybe, like, you know, like two or three, like, pieces of, like, ribs still left to eat from last night's barbecue, you know, just jamming out, relaxing, and just wheeling this monster 9, 10, 11 inch bait and just waiting for one to absolutely jar your teeth. So, obviously, I think the swim bait is obviously going to be a big player. A uh, ton of fish that live, monster fish that live in around those boat docks. That's their ecosystem. They spawn underneath the walkway, they come back out, and they live underneath those big docks. Um, or those big points or those bluff ends. You know, know, most of the people obviously kind of know what's going on. So I think swim bait number one. And then number two, I think if you check the historical data once again, I think it's going to be a shallow, uh, shallow potential catch. I mean, 
even when you have that many people on the water, what I've noticed when I've been around it is then there's a lot of people just don't want to go behind a boat dock. Let them. They're like, well, <laughs> let them stay out there. Yeah, they're like, why would I go back there? There's only a 693 underneath that float. I don't want to go back there and have to deal with this. You know, I don't know what's pull them over on. a cable. <laughs> yeah, I would hate to have one dig my toenails in the front deck with a flipping stick and <laughs> just really kind of figure out what's going on. But I think you know a, a, a brush hog, a Texas rig brush hog. I think skipped around a, a walkway float. Uh, you have to go behind the docks, and, and I see people just they just kind of cast and they don't go behind them, and then and I'm sure they cast checks haphazardly throwing around oh, these yeah. docks, right? They, they, I mean, they're they swimming everywhere. around. They live everywhere. But they, gosh, man, eighty per you know eighty percent of fish live in twenty percent of the water. Where is it? Uh, so this is this. So I kind of describe this a lot of times. So it's it's kind of what I think about is I think about trying to catch. Uh, you got to remember this is a fish. It's a predator. It's trying to catch a meal, right? So if we had to catch a cow, mm-hmm. would you rather catch a cow in a hundred acre field or would you rather catch a cow in your living room? <laughs> It'd be easier to catch them in your living room. So so that flow, and that's why top water fishing, which that's another one of the options we can talk about. So that's why top water fishing I think is so unbelievably good for big fish because they know when they press that bait to the surface, they ain't got there's nowhere no to go. place to go. No. It's created a backstop for yep. it. And they're smart and they're efficient. Big fish don't go swimming around everywhere chasing things. Yep. They'll hunker into a little ambush spot. They'll wait for the moment that they want to take advantage of. They'll they'll waste the least amount of energy, yep. and they will go ahead and capitalize. And that's why shallow water fishing is always so good for big fish. Yep. You know, prime example is you go to Lake of the Ozarks right now. You go to the fronts, the floats out in front. How many fish you can catch? You can catch a, a million. A million. If you yeah. had enough time, you yeah. could you could not stop. Yep. How many six pounders are you can catch out there? Not very many. Not very many. Not very many. Yep. It's, it, that's exactly right. I mean, that's the... the those Every two fish. pounder, half, half pound to two pounds are all well, you, out there. You know, it, it's it's kind of like that's how the fish, you know, the old the old saying, you know, you got to you gotta kill a bunch of rabbits before you learn how to kill whales. Well, it's the same thing on the fishing side of things. I think those fish go and they operate in packs and they see what everybody else is doing. They see all that forage and they get there and then they learn the craft of assassination, mm-hmm. right? They learn the efficiency <laughs> of the hunt. The bass assassins. The bass assassins are in there because that's all they are is really assassins. I mean, they're just, they're trying to breed. They're trying to keep from being eaten and they're trying to eat. That's mm-hmm. it. I mean, that's as simple as it gets. And and I think it's a situation where that's why that shallow water piece, you're exactly right. They learn how to kill out there on the corners and then they get efficient and they get in there shallow. Yep. Or they'll get around some sort of piece of cover, right? A 12 foot brush pile on a flat. They'll wait right there in that brush pile and know that the ceiling is right above this limb or when the fish comes near the bottom of the pile, they know where that backstop is where they can really get them. Mm-hmm. They just know, and, and that's where they're always at. So you think, they, you think the big fish get dominant and push out the little fish? Yes, I do. I do. It's kind of like, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I guess basically the older I get in life, the more I kind of want to be left alone too. <laughs> He's kind of prickly. <laughs> you know, if there, if there was a bunch of screaming screaming kids and everything in the room, you know, I yeah. mean, that's... We find the garage children. and a beer. I love children, yeah. Hey, <laughs> yeah. honey, can I please go out in the garage Help. and drink a beer and sit in the boat for a minute, you know? So, yeah. so I think that, and I don't know whether they don't like it, but I just know that it's hard for them to be as efficient when they got those little mm. ones that are constantly chasing. You're notorious for pile fishing. Yeah. So if you pull up and you pop a two-pounder, mm-hmm. I mean, do you keep, I mean... I, Yes. Me, the redneck, dumb fisherman of me, I'm going to catch every two-pounder I can. Yeah. But is that a, I don't want to say a bad omen, but is that one of those signs that you go, eh, that's probably what's in here? I, I, yes and no. I, you know what's interesting? So if you have, a, so first of all, on the tournament fishing side of things, during practice, there's a, just a handful of places that a cast never gets made. I'm not saying it's yeah. right or wrong when you talk about the philosophy of tournament fishing, how I believe, but I'm just saying there's certain places. So when you get into that tournament and you're going to those places and you know it's a fresh spot, I mean, I first cast, I may throw it out there before the, it, the line may sink four foot and one One's gets on. it. Yeah, and then the line may sink eight foot and one gets it. The first limb, one gets it. Uh, and then all of a sudden, after, you know, maybe two or three casts in a row, you throw in there and one nothing and nothing, then all of a sudden, boom, you may zap a 620. But I, but also, too, what I think happens is, it, just based on my experience, what happens is this brush just kind of deteriorates, it kind of rolls out, boat anchors get stuck on it, pull it out, current, so on and so forth. So if I could draw on a chalkboard the absolute best scenario, it would be a medium-sized brush pile with a separate smaller brush pile next to it. Mm-hmm. And I think you need the – it's kind of weird. We talked about this earlier. Um, 
shad, Mother Nature's so weird because... Because they still got to get around food, and the shad's going to find the big thing, right? The shad's going to find the big thing. That's yeah. what's crazy. Yeah, well, crawdads or what? Bluegill? Yeah. Brim? Yeah. If you, you know, shad, if, you, if you'll if you go on a fall day when it's clear, when it's sunny outside, and you want to find where every brush pile is that's less than 12 foot, yep. just find all the different dark spots. Yeah. Because they want to be around it for some reason. That's Little cool. do they know yeah. that it's the it's the funnel of death, right? I mean, <laughs> and know. then they start swimming tighter. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. When they're real loose, you're like, ah, not really much going on. When they get real, real tight, and they're yeah. a dark spot, and they're on a flat and isolated flat, and they're one spot. Chances are, there's a brush pile underneath it. Yep. And uh, but if I could, I would have that, you know, because I think three and four pound fish would get in there. If you want to talk about a humdinger, a five or a six pounder, it's usually off on its own in a little piece of isolated cover that it can maintain yeah. and control and not have to worry about anything. Yep. Or it might be a 50-pound blue cat. I mean, either one pole. <laughs> either, either, they either both one. eat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> That's true. You better be. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you don't eat bass? No. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Um, all right, so... Top water, flipping top behind water, docks. Top water. So uh, number one, swim bait. Number two, probably a flip bait. Would you really do that? I mean, really, at the end of the day, you put your money in this tournament. Uh-huh. You fish tournaments day in, day out. Day Most of these guys, yeah. they're flipping spinner baits around docks. They're throwing jerk baits in the spring, spinner baits, A rigs, yeah. jigs. Yeah. And then you say big bass bash, and some dude from California comes and blasts a big one on a, to- a swim bait. Yeah. And then Brennan and all the, you know, some of the guys that work in the back here, they catch them on that all the time up there. Like, is that really an option for that? You know, and I don't want to say average fisherman because that's not fair to say, but yeah. just the normal guy. I mean, do you go buy a two hundred dollar KGB swim bait and the big setup, and you go up there and do that? Uh, you know, I own a tackle store too, by the way. So the yes would be written on play. I don't just buy yeah. one KGB swim bait; I buy five. Buy five, no. all colors. <laughs> yeah, we've only got six in stock, but you need to come buy five. No, but re- I mean, is it really an option, really? I, you know, that's an interesting question because here's here's what I know about fishermen, or what I think I know about fishermen is they have an absolute addiction to it mm-hmm. right i mean the so ones that do the swim bait the, stuff the ones that do the swim bait stuff yeah, they are agree. just you know if you tell them that they got one of their friends got a bite on this bait <laughs> they're gone they're calling in sick from work or they're not, they're ditching class for school <laughs> and they're and they're leaving to go to try to get one or two baits on these bi- uh, bites on these baits so mm-hmm. um but you're right though because when you start talking about that stuff, you do need a special rod. You do need a special line. You do need a special reel. You need you need probably an understanding of doing some things, which means you probably have an upgrade in electronics and things like that. So so I don't know. I'd say probably 25% of the field probably is just going fishing with the allure of I could win 100 grand. winning 100 grand on one cast. Yep. I think the other 75%, yeah, I, I think that they are absolutely committed to – taking whatever style they like and applying it to the lake of which it's most conducive. Yep. I, I really do because Lake of the Ozark is just a fantastic fishery. And, and these people, they fish it. If you fish the fall, you fish the spring. Yep. So they know the lake or, or they they a tournament here or there. So mm-hmm. they're familiar with it. So I, I think it's truly viable. Yep. Okay. So swim bait, viable yep. option. Yep. Swim bait's going to be a big deal. Shallow water float on a boat dock in any one of the 90-some miles of her. <laughs> work um you know from the gravinator <laughs> to the uh to the to the niangelis to uh you know up there above the uh, there's somebody the taking Warsaw. notes going i've never heard of those <laughs> that's just what we always call them but um you know I, I think that's a big player i think top water is a big player i think you know top water is more spooking plopper yeah, in uh, spook, shady spots plopper. sunny spots doesn't matter i mean yeah absolutely i think the shade is very very important you know that time of the year you kind of got sun sits in the southeast and sets in the southwest so you got a lot of shade options to work with um a lot of times i've seen them sit underneath the shade of the walkway mm-hmm. like i'm superstitious to the point where i just want to fish the shady side and then i got my teeth kicked in a couple times <laughs> watching guys going over there and catching them, and the only shade that really that fish was provided was the walkway. Yep. And Pins they, them in. Uh-huh, and it gives a much more of a fine, defined pattern to get on. Yep. And, and so I think that's that's a big buzz bait, I think, is, you know, it's conditions-based, right? So if you've got a lot of chop on the water, um, you know, I think that's where you get kind of the rear rudder baits, you know, your ploppers and your choppos and your all of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, some of your bigger walking baits. If it's, you know, maybe a little bit calmer, I think you kind of get into the, you know, maybe a, a, a 
buzz bait or uh, some sort of walking bait as well, back behind the docks, behind the cables. Once again, what, what are you throwing them on? Like what's like if you're gonna throw a spook, spook junior, something yeah. like that? Yeah. What are you throwing it on? So I'm probably gonna throw it on about a seven two, seven three, medium heavy rod. Yeah. Is what I'm throw so you're on not doing a parabolic bin. You're not doing that. You're no. cracking them. Yeah, I'm cracking them. I mean, it would be the same rod that I would probably throw a chatterbait on. Same rod that I would probably slow roll like a three quarter ounce spinner bait on. Yep. Or even a half ounce spinner bait when the fish get big in the spring. I mean, it's oh. yeah. I haven't really gotten into the parabolic bin thing, to be honest with you. I mean, I was raised uh, fishing by Bill Davenport, and if I brought a rod in that bent more than the third guy down, Chunk I was, yeah, I was in trouble. I was in trouble. But I, I, think, <laughs> I think, I think, I think, especially if I lost one. Let me see. Hey, boy, let me see your rod. Well, no, well, no wonder broke. why. Gee whiz, what are you supposed to do with that? <laughs> but uh, you know, I think it's one of those things where, yeah, it's 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 a fairly big rod and fairly big, you know, it's braid and yep. it's, you know, what pound braid are you throwing that? Oh, I'm probably throwing fifty. Okay, fifty is what yep. I'm gonna do. You're not uh, a thirty guy. I'm not a thirty guy. What's I, the difference between fifty and thirty? Not a daggum thing, except for they break your heart. Yeah, I think. Yeah, <laughs> they'll break. Twenty pound braid to me is like death. Yeah, I mean it's it is. It's I a mean, false level of confidence. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> we can go a lot of different directions, and then I'm gonna yeah. stop. Yeah. But thirty yeah. and twenty pound braid to me is like <laughs> no, no. The, no. Only, the only thing that does is like when you go to throw it, and you got like one of those braid lashes at twenty or thirty. What you get to see is your cricket flying over the horizon, Hi. <laughs> landing on top of the tallest dock in the freaking creek. Yep, yep. That's what you get. Kids screaming, running back in the house with a plopper hanging off his back, and the cat <laughs> bit it. And hanging, I mean, it's just disaster. Don't buy 30 pound braids. <laughs> We're going to get an email from somebody. Yeah, exactly. I have, for the record, actually gotten ladders and climbed on top of people's docks before. For what bait? Uh, the very, very first, very, very first mega bass jerk bait ever for the Midwest. <laughs> I literally at, rang the doorbell because I somehow got it stuck on top of the roof. Multiple times, by the way. Multiple times. <laughs> Don't know how, but I have literally had to ask for permission which I may or may not been given to yep. go get on the roof to get yep. the mega bass. Yep. That was when, you know, I mean. I'm trying to be nice to give you a courtesy. I'm going on your duck. Yeah, that's right. See I'm you asking bye. for permission, but I realize you're not here. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's watching on the ring like, oh, my gosh. This oh is my way gosh. before ring. He's trying to steal something. <laughs> ring wasn't even a spiff in somebody's eye at that point. No, it was, it, was, it was nowhere near reality. Yeah, I got it back. <laughs> did I get so, it back? Yeah. I'd still be on the dock if I didn't. But, you know, that was the day. I mean, you can't come in. Like, bait works. You can, I can come in there, and I can pick out any one of them, any color, any rainbow, over the rainbow, combination thereof, depths. I mean, transparency, shine, flash. I can come in your store, and I can get, you know, there's there's 340 of them out there. Man, this was back in the day when there was four. In the country. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and three of them were in your box. And this was the one that worked, yep. you know? <laughs> yeah. You know that fish at Grand I caught? We got like 70,000 TikTok views on. Yeah. It was an original wiggle wart by uh, Fall Creek, and he oh, didn't yeah. paint them anymore. And I didn't give a daggum crap about the fish. I wanted my wiggle wart back. <laughs> that's exactly That's exactly. <laughs> I was going wrestling with that fish for that wiggle wart back. Oh, man. I, I go stories and stories about things I've done to get lures. <laughs> that's that's a – we need to have like – we need to have like a – uh, older than PG thirteen for what I've had to do to some <laughs> Sip on whiskey fish <laughs> just to get these lures back. It's kind of weird. All right, number one, swim bait. Two, flipping. Three, top water. All right, four. I'm gonna go with a. He's uh, out, so uh, uh, you're yeah, kind of well, out. So one through three is probably where you need to. <laughs> well, what's that, that? This is where you dance right here. So <laughs> I'm staying one through three. Okay, so one, two, and three is if I got some wind, if I got some clouds, if I got some conditions. Yep. Okay. Um, what if? What if it's dead if, slick if and it's, sunny? If it's slicker and a cat's, you know what? Then I would say that I'm going to. I'm going to take a jig or I'm going to take a worm and I'm going to put it on a stick in about 12 to 18 foot of water on some sort of main lake or next to main lake flat. Gotcha. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going straight to the living room. And I'm going to knock on the door and see if I can get some rent money. <laughs> You've been living here. That's what I tell them all the time when I'm, in, when, I'm in, when I'm just like, if I just, I just can't get things going. I just need to remind them. I said, we built this condo for you and your family. We've not asked for one dollar <laughs> of rent. I'm here to ask for some rent. <laughs> so you or remember Marcus your family is going for a brush pile. <laughs> needs to he's go going, ahead and bite this worm yeah. or jig so yeah. I can. He's pay going my to the bills. bass condo. <laughs> so explain this to me because this is something I've always wondered, and I should ask you privately so not everybody knows. But I'm not that mm -hmm. way. But 
why in the Toyota series, which is always a week or so later, yeah, why do we catch them in like 25 foot brush, 24 foot brush? But right now we catch them in six inches of water. Like, you know what I mean? Like I, to me, it, it's a circle, right? You know, you're out deep and then you go shallow and spawn. Then you go back out deep and then you come back shallow for the fall and you go back out deep. You know what I mean? These fish don't move surely to God from 30 foot of water to the last three docks in a cove yeah. and then back out to right. 50 foot of water in three weeks time frame. So is it just different fish funneling moving? What's your theory on that? Yeah. So obviously no way to prove it, but I do have a theory. I think right now, uh, probably about the last week of August, first week of September is whenever the split happens, right? So the split is half the fish go shallow, half the fish go deep. But as fishermen, most of the fish that go deep are, in my opinion, four pounds or less to really three and a half pounders. Hmm. Right. I mean, like if, if you really start looking at 25 foot foot rock piles and things like that, in my opinion, the guys who will really, really stomp your guts out is when you can't get a bite nowhere else and they just 17 and a half pound you to death. Mm -hmm. They're going through not only numbers, but they're healthy fish. They haven't been messed with. Nobody messed with them. So quality. the split happens. And I think what happens is as fishermen, you know, we are pursuing a fish. It's a lot easier to catch one in 15 foot of water than it is 25. So we're pursuing those fish that are coming on that shallow split. And then after that, I think what happens is we realize that they're weird. They're moving. They're dormant. We've they're pushed pressured. on those. Yeah. These are easier to catch. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. We, I can we, buy that. We have bought bananas at the grocery store all fall long. There's no more bananas left to be bought. So we're going orange. to get, yeah, we're going to go and get eat oranges. Yep. And because nobody's been messing with the oranges because number one, I don't think they're as big, and number two, they're twenty-five plus foot to fish. To dip, you know, so so well, okay. So what do you fish a? What do you throw at a twenty-five footer? Right, you throw a, you throw a drop shot, you throw a big swim bait, a heavy-headed swim bait, like a one-ounce swim bait, or you throw like a twenty-five foot crank bait, or you throw a one-ounce jig. Mm -hmm. All of those, I mean, there's that's a lot of work. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you're gonna wheel. My favorite deep diving crankbait is a 6 cent C25. To me, it's the best big fish crankbait ever built that I've ever thrown ever in my life. You're going to go wield that thing for 734 casts in a day. You're going to know it, especially if you make a bad cast. You're going to have some guns like these. Oh. <laughs> Let's edit that part out. <laughs> my, 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 I hate when I throw that thing and I want to throw it on a perfect line and it goes about 15 foot to the left. It just of hooks. It. Oh, yeah, and I'm just like, oh my, because you can throw it for a mile. And I'm just like, man, I, I got to reel this bad cast in for a mile. <laughs> <laughs> and the faster I want it in here, the harder it By is. By that nine o'clock time, your mouth butter goes, hey, <laughs> yeah. caught him on a shaky head. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's what happens. It never fails. So, anyways, but yeah, I think I think that you know that's where I think the you know the brush pile. So you don't think they in. move? You still think the fish are there? They just. But sh okay, so Shad, like we were at Truman doing a boat mm -hmm. demo ride thing yeah. this Saturday, and I got really excited because we were in the back of Starrett Creek, and like there were balls of shad, and they were like all balled up doing their thing, and I'm like, oh, it was the first cool morning that I've been around, and yeah, you know, it's like tis the season, it's here, you that's know, it's exactly going to start right. happening. So, do you think that shad's out on the main lake, and then they're starting to break and come up? Is that what causes that split? Yeah, I think that's exactly what causes that yep. split. I think there's a certain level of shad, like. And I don't know if it's thermocline, I don't know if it's water quality, I don't know if it's temperature, I don't know if it's oxygen, I don't know what it is, but something happens. I mean, you can tell because like July, August, all of a sudden you'll look out there and just start seeing spoonbill just jumping, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, that's an oxygen thing. But it's, but I think that's kind of what happens. And, and so think about this too, right? So those less than 25 footers, what they do is they've been on these shad and think about days that you've gone in the fall and you have absolutely blistered them. Mm -hmm. on top water, right, related to the bank. So what that ha what that means is those shad that those fish are on are somewhere between the shoreline and less than 10 foot out, mm -hmm. right? Because that's where, that's where all the bites are. That's where they're up feeding. Well, then the next day you come back and you can't get a bite on top water. It's not because they're not willing to bite it. It's because where you're throwing it, they're not there, mm -hmm. right? Those shad have since positioned themselves either under the dock, on the bottom, out in the middle of the cove. So if I don't catch fish, I should just assume they were here yesterday. That's exactly that's right. Find the shad, <laughs> Daniel son. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like, I mean, that's the lesson of it, though, is is they move, right? That They move a ton. They move a ton. I mean, talk to some of these forward-facing sonar guys, and they can tell you you have no idea how – They'll get locked in on one fish, and it will just absolutely go somewhere 
that it's more gone. than comfortable, <laughs> gone out in the middle of nowhere and sit there. That's they have swim bladders, right? Lake Lake at the Ozarks to me, I always joke in the fall. We always seem to have bigger tournaments there in the fall. Yeah. We have the last few years. And like I go, you know, you need to find some shad chasers. That's, That's what right. I call them, right? right? You know, those two and a half pounders, three right. pounders and smaller right. shad chasers. And then you need to go find bass condos or whatever you want to call it where they're gonna they live there. They they're the, the dominant fish. That's right. You know, so you know these guys coming in to fish the big bass bash what I mean, I feel like you know, if you, it's fun to go out there and just blister a man. I mean, it, it is fun, and that is one of those lakes that it just keeps pumping out two and three pounders. Yes, it does. But does that do any good? No, no. And, and I think, but I think that's also too. You know, and, and I mean this with all due respect, but I think that's the amateur fisherman. I mean, that's what that whole entire event's geared for, and that's why you see. I, I've seen it before. The best three floats in the whole entire creek, and there's not one boat that will go in between those docks. Mm-hmm. And the and the reason it is is because they're amateurs. Not from a from a negative side of things, but but because they want to get feedback, they're mm-hmm. looking for bites. Bang, bang, I need bites. Bang. So if I'm catching a bunch of two pounders yep. throwing down the side of this dock, I'm okay because you never know. I'm one cast away from a hundred thousand, and that's totally true. But the tournament fishermen, you know, I, it surprises me sometimes when you catch fifteen or twenty keepers and you don't I really have just, a size. I was just about to ask you. Yeah. How many good fish a day are you looking for? Truly, in the fall, in October. Oh, in the fall, three. Three. So, I, I mean, so make no bones about it. You're yeah. not going to go catch 10, 15, 24 pounders probably Typically, in a day. Typically, no way. No sure, way. you can have a day. If I can catch, if I can catch, in, uh, just for the tournament fish, remember, if I can catch three over four, yep. okay, so there's 12, yep. right? And probably a, they're, they're four and a quarter. Even and add two and a half, and they have five pounds to that. Good Lord, you're at 17 pounds. Name of check. You're, you're going to get a check. Two day tournaments, I bet you, I'd take, I'd take a dollar bill for every yep. two day tournament where it took less than 35 pounds. Yep. I, be, be, yeah, and it doesn't. And, and I, you may catch twenty five day one, and day two you struggle to catch 10. twelve. Yeah, yeah, twelve pounds. Yeah. So if you can get three bites, that's the crazy thing about tournament fishing that just enamors my brain. Is like I'm, we're talking about a thousand casts in a day, and the difference between the winner and second is one cast. The difference between the winner and tenth is two casts. Yep. Right. How many of them looked at it? You know what I mean? How many five pounders did you put it on their nose and they go, yeah, just not right now? I'd like to think there's a many, but you never know. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I get it. I believe there's every cast, there's one looking at it. You kind of have to. Yep. Uh, but yep. that's just the mentality. It's just yep. different. You know, I think that's important for people to understand is, you know, I, I think, how do we say it? I don't even know the right word to say. You know, like people think about Marcus Sakura or a, you know, whatever top angler on the lake, a Dion or whatever. And they think you're going out there and blasting four pounders all day. Oh, he caught. Did you see? What did you catch last weekend up there? Uh, I had 20. Well, we had we had a little over 40 in two days. Of the, one day we had 17 something. Next day we had 22 something. Okay. So you just blasted them all, all day, both days, smoked them? Um, not really. I mean, you know, first day we probably caught 15, 17 keepers. Uh, we had 17 and a half pounds and never had a five pound bite. And then the second day, we had a limit, so yeah. This is so, this is this is like you know you looking like oh my god you caught twenty two pounds exactly right? like that's okay, a world record day for pounds. most guys. I'd love to catch twenty. Okay, pounds. so we had a limit. I can tell you exactly what happened. We had a limit at uh, we took off at six o'clock or six thirty. We had a limit in an hour that weighed twelve pounds. Mm-hmm. Right, they're just you throw it out there. Ooh, if there's one you're around, on my type of pattern, buddy. <laughs> they're going. They're doing it. <laughs> so we have a limit, and then we pulled into a spot at nine fifty. And at 9.50, the next 10 casts we made, we caught seven over four pounds. <laughs> okay? That's a good couple minutes. That's, yeah, that's, 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 that's like, oh, my gosh, this is unbelievable. So fast forward to by the time you're calling, by the time you're dealing with all that stuff, now all of a sudden it's 11 o'clock. Mm-hmm. Okay? 11 o'clock, except for the very last cast we made of the day, we never caught a fish over two and a half pounds. Isn't that crazy? And yeah. it's just like... So not only do you not catch a bunch of big ones, but you also, if you take the best hour out of any tournament that mm-hmm. I've ever won, if you take the best hour out of the day, you may not have anything. Mm-hmm. So that's what, but that's what's so unbelievably cool about this sport that we love so much is it's, it's are they there? When do I need to be there? And what do I need to do to execute? Yep. So there's always three factors in my mind that I'm going through. So how do, you, how, how do you get that dialed in? I mean, how do you feel like you say, well, I'm going to pull up to Dardanelle in Arkansas 
and not only do I got to try to catch a fish on this gar hole, but I got to figure yeah. out when to be here. I mean, what, yeah. what, what indicators are you seeing or doing to do that? So what, so I guess basically my philosophy on that is number one, I got to get it into an area where I feel like they're there. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I, during practice I'm fishing and I'm getting bites. And then depending on what I do during practice, when I go out in the event, unless there was a click, you know, man, I took off, man, there's no bite in the morning. And, and, and sometimes it's weird. The whole entire lake will kind of lay out, you know, and, the number one answer is time on the water. But number two, you'll you'll feel it, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, people always say, I want you to teach me how to fish. I, I can't teach you something. you got to feel something because I'm a feeler. Something to feel right, I don't do it. If, if I feel like I need to make a change, I do. But if you'll notice, in the morning, I've got no bites. At 9 o'clock, I kind of get a bite, one or here, one there. At 1 o'clock, they're going wide open throttle. So you'll kind of know. And I, I need to be on my juice at that time. I need what to be I on perceive is my juice. That's exactly right. Yep. Or if I don't have anything else going, I'm probably going to make sure that I hit that that area or those particular fish two or three times during the same day. Yeah, you right? have no problem with wheeling back into an area, going checking off, zero. coming back zero, yep. zero. Especially if I don't have anything else, because I can tell you that. Number one, I know that they're there. Number two, now to me in my mind is just timing them. Mm-hmm. It's just timing them and. And, and it may just be the single big fish of the day, right? Or, um, you know, like, for instance, wintertime, I used to do this all the time back home before we had kids, which I, I love my kids more than I do this, so I wouldn't trade it. But during work in the wintertime, like, it was like, it's pretty slow, mm-hmm. and, and, and I'm pretty flexible at work. So me and one of my best friends, you know, he's in the construction world, so we would go fishing 2 o'clock to 5.30, right? He didn't have kids. I didn't have kids. He lived close. We're going to put the boat in. We're going to fish from 2 to 5.30. We're going to start on that point, and we're just going that direction. And we would go that direction for a month and a half. Mm-hmm. And I knew, and in the wintertime, it's the latest part of the day. The mm-hmm. water's the warmest. They're, they're going to bite. They're, they're going to bite. bite. Yep. They're going to bite. And literally what I would do is I knew from this place all the way to this place, I knew where every school of big ones were, mm-hmm. right? So I had 10 schools of big ones. So guess what happens during tournament day? All I do is I go through 10 spots, 10 spots. Now, I might go from number one to number three if the wind's not blowing right in number two, or I might go from number one to number seven if the wind's blowing better in number seven. Mm -hmm. But I got 10 schools of fish that I'm fishing. And lo and behold, we may not have anything at 1 o'clock. And 2 o'clock, we may have 27. Mm. And it's just one of those situations where if you know where they're at, you know, it's so much of its timing, and people don't understand that, or people think, Man, they're really biting at 10 o'clock, so I really want to start there. Well, then the only thing you've done is just lost confidence in the spot. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, you know? 100%. I fished through the best place I got. I was the first boat in here, and I got zero bites. <laughs> they're gone. I got to go. We're, gonna, we're running. Now what? We're, go- we're going to Truman. <laughs> Please, now what? Now what we do, Cletus? I don't know. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. Timing is, timing. the moral of the story is timing is a big deal. John, how long have we talked? All right. What else? Um, I mean, I think we dove pretty deep into that on the Big Bass Bash. I mean, I think I, I think if 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 you're looking at this or listening to this or watching this, you know, I, I think there's a lot of theories that are put out. There's a lot of good content for yeah, sure. Yeah. You know how you apply it. You know, is Marcus? <laughs> Let's give a waypoint away. <laughs> Let's see how many boats <laughs> hit. <laughs> yeah, that's not what it is. And if you're fishing off somebody else's waypoint, it probably ain't gonna work out for you. You probably no. might check out golf. <laughs> yeah. No. It's it's just uh, you know I think yeah I think we covered it. You know I mean we just we just keep coming back and doing it more and more. You know what I'm saying and mm-hmm. just trying to find something else. I just you know I think maybe we need to talk. It'd be kind of cool to break down the philosophy of like tournament fishing and like what it is and why is it and what is it that like that you're that, that attracts us right because it's obviously a disease in both of our brains right um so i think that would be kind of a cool one to do think about how much we were gluttons for punishment yeah you're gonna make a thousand casts if you could catch two over four pounds or three two one for me three for marcus <laughs> He's a little less on the punishment side. You, we did something, you know, to, yeah. for five bites. I don't know what that percentage, but good lord, it well, ain't it's very like, good. Well, <laughs> and, and break it down to like somebody who doesn't even know anything about it. So let me get this straight: you woke up four hours before you even launched the boat, yep. right? Then you launch the boat, it's you cold. sit around. It's cold. <laughs> it's rainy. It's nasty. Then you drive the boat through all this cold, rainy, nasty temperatures to get over there, and then you finally do get a bite. And you try to reel it in as fast as you can, put it in the live well, shut the lid, and go. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, yeah. 
Do it again. Yeah. Why aren't we like, you know, enjoying the fight? Why aren't we like, you know, like the fly fisherman? That, right? I was just about to say that's called fly, fly fishing. fishing. Yeah. <laughs> fly fisherman, you know. Yeah. When it's, I get stressed in the wintertime and it's just like, all right, I need a break, I go fly fish. Because it is like that. But bass fishing, no. That's almost like northern fishing to me, like going up north. Yeah. Like it's not bass fishing. Like I don't like it's not even the same thing. Like we right. can go up there and catch like a hundred four pounders today. You want to go? I've got the mark like the rocks marked. Yeah. Like it's easy. Coming back here, it's like, oh my gosh, if I could catch Ten four pounders in a day, I'd be jumping up and down. Oh, and by the way, this is the one of the best fisheries in the entire United States too. And we're just like, man, it's 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 hard, you know. And and in the fall, it gets even worse. Like they're not they're they're still lean, they're still stressed from summer. They're you know a five pound head and a three and a half pound body, mm-hmm. and you know it's just it, for me catching multiples in an area. There's there's a couple times, you know what I mean. Like there there are those are more shad chasers to yeah, me. Yeah, no because doubt. Because the big ones, you'll catch one out of twenty two, and then you'll hop up and catch a twelve foot brush pile. There'll be a little bit of wind running behind that boat dock, yeah. and you go fire a plopper across it, and you catch another three. Yeah. Like it's not, it's you know, if you're fishing the big bass bash, one don't let boats spin. Yeah, there's gonna be boats everywhere, right? That's right. And like the guys that just kind of go with the flow and just go fish, just like if you, yeah, just go, just yeah. go fish and go hop and go move and go change and. In my opinion, you put 15 rods on the deck and you go fling it at whatever looks good. Dude, it, that's, that's, that is exactly the long version of what I mean when I am a feeler. Yeah. Right? Yep. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been driving down the lake and all of a sudden something catches my <laughs> eye. Yep. <laughs> yep. Pull a U-turn. You know, right turn, Clyde. We're going to go over there. The wind's hitting it right. It's set up right. I seen a shad flicker over there when I was driving down the lake. Something happens, and I can't tell you how many times, you know, just that instinctual change, and you're rewarded for it. And that's that's really the – that's whenever it's unbelievably cool, you know. Now, I can also say in the fall, for me personally, that also probably creates the greatest divide in my brain, mm-hmm. right? Because if I'm fishing shallow and I'm not getting the feedback that I want, and I look over my shoulder, and I'm like, maybe they're out there. Mm-hmm. So then you get out there – and they're not doing it, and then you it's see tough. that, yeah, because yeah. it's tough. Yep. You got to pick one. Yep. You're gonna get seven bites today. Yep. That's it. Yep. So, and if, if you bounce, you're gonna get four. Yeah, and if you, yep. yeah, no, if, I you, agree. if you if you bounce and your timing's off on the bounce, you're gonna get none. Yep. Right, because the whole time they were doing it out deep was mm-hmm. from nine to ten. Well, that's where you were up there flipping docks. This is such a time of year. Why I think I do pretty decent in the fall at Ozarks is because I just. You make a plan and you just go. I'm going to run my brush piles, the ones that yep. you don't cast in all year, yep. and you just go run them and you run them all the way up and you run them all the way back, or you hop when the winds, are, whatever that is, and you get you, not normally. I mean, last year I popped them pretty fast, but it's just it's normally one here, one there, That's right. one here. It's a junk low fishing too. Here, you know, seven eight rods on the front deck. Put your head down. Put grind. your nose down. Grind. 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 Yep. Grind. That's exactly right. But what I love to do is I love, like, whenever it's all of a sudden we've got this string of warm, decent, stable weather, and then all of a sudden here comes a cold front with a north wind. All right, we're done. And then, <laughs> I, 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 lo- I, loved, I love to get a crankbait rod out or a topwater rod out. What are you cranking? Just like deep? Eat. Like deep, deep or shallow? No, probably, t- yeah, probably 10 to 18-foot deep brush piles. Yeah. But the difference is, like, when I'm worming them or I'm jigging them or I'm doing something like that, I maybe hit, you know, I don't know, maybe, I don't know what the duration is, but it's probably, you know, I don't know, it takes me a little while to fish brush pile. Two or three casts, That's four right. or five casts. Then you're just. the other one, two or three casts, four or five casts, and then you're leaving. You're just banging them. Cranking, dude. I mean, I. I would don't even that. take your life jacket off. We ain't no, going to be there that that's long. That's exactly right. Sometimes <laughs> I don't even shut the motor off. Yeah. You know, we're in here. We're, you know, we're going. So I love to keep the trolling motor on high. And I would love to have somebody with one of those little metal clickers, you know, you know, there's a pile, there's a pile, there's a pile, there's a pile. Oh, there's one. Get the net. And it's just, you know, you're just going and just running and gunning. And it's so freaking fun because you know, you're going to collide with them somewhere. Yeah. You know, and then and, and when then, you do, it's probably a school, really, in that style of fishing. Yeah, absolutely, no. absolutely. And then you're going to trip over a random big one too. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to be like, because because of the experience that I have, <laughs> you can be like, okay, cool. There was one in this pile. There's one in this pile. But the showstopper is that pile right there. So I'm going to make sure I kind of slow down, get my head right, make a good presentation. And I love when I'm like 
reeling that crankbait and pulling that rod, and that crankbait hits the pile, and then I kind of let it up on some slack line. I'll pull that rod, and it hits that pile again, and it's fluttering up, and that rod tip just goes away from you, just, you know, and you're just like, holding, you pull back on Help! it. Help! <laughs> you pull back on it, and, like, it's so big, whatever you got on there, that you almost think you're stuck because you got to look at the end of your rod. To see, see if it's it moving. <laughs> And then when it surges twice away from you, most 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 whoa. mere mortals around here don't have that problem on this lake. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, that's, that's I set the hook and they go flying over the boat. <laughs> Get the net climb. Yeah, they come up, you know, they start going like whoosh whoosh. You go. <laughs> well, well, I might take you one day, Drew. All right, <laughs> <laughs> all right. He's gonna teach me how to catch him on a net rig. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you for watching. Hope you guys learned something. I think there's a lot of content. If you didn't learn something, you need to do something different. So I <laughs> don't mean to be rude. Uh, appreciate it. Check us out. Marcus, you got Facebook, social media? Yeah, man, doing the Facebook thing. Yep. Just my own personal name, Marcus Sakura. And uh, we've done a bunch of videos today yeah. at Baitworks, so you'll see some of those. We're doing some on the water footage, stuff like that. So yeah. make sure you're watching Baitworks and Boatworks on social media Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Our YouTube channel has a bunch of good content, so check out our YouTube channel. Um, that's all for me. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you.